everyone's time and make sure you have as much time as possible to be able to talk to Ms. Kim Neal. So my name is Catherine Huckabee. I'm with the Community Engagement Office here with the City of Fort Worth. I'm going to help host today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping tools. I'm pretty sure everybody knows how to share your feedback at this point, but real quick, um, up in the top right hand corner, the little thought bubbles, those are our chat session. So that is perfect for you to share your insights, additional resources, or if you agree or disagree with anything that Ms. Kim is saying, um, you can put that in the chat session. And then the very next section says questions. It looks like a classroom. You, from there, if you have any questions during the presentation that you would like for Kim or her team to answer um, at the end, then please put that there. And then at the end, I will go through and read out each question and make sure that everyone has been heard in that way. And then the third section is a poll that Kim put up. She would love to know, know what it is that made you decide to come today. So if you would complete that poll, that would be great. And then if you just really want to see how many other people are involved in the conversation today, click on the people tab, which is uh, three little tabs down and you can see all of the names. If you want to talk privately with any of those people, you can click on their name and it will pop up a little um, button for you to not only know more about them, where what city they're from, what their title is, but also you can chat with them privately. And those chats are not saved in any way in the system. So we won't know anything you're saying. So if you want to reach out to Sonia, I'm just gonna pick on her because I looked at that name and talk about how awesome Vanessa is. Vanessa will never see that through this entire presentation, but you guys can definitely do that on your own. And then last but not least, Kim has put an abundance of resources for you in the file section. So the very last tab on the right hand corner, these are all documents that um, have been put together and used by Kim and her team over the last year and a half. And if any of those things she's referencing you want to pull down, you can just download them instantly to your computer um, and that way you'll have access to them. Another quick reminder that this presentation is being recorded. The files will stay here as well. So if you want to come back anytime between now and the end of August, you'll just go straight back to the virtual lobby, go to this uh, exact workshop, and you can find those files there to be able to download. So um, at this time, I'm going to introduce Ms. Kim Neal. She is the director, and she is also the police oversight monitor of the OPOM office. We are very honored to have her, and she also has her team that I believe she's going to introduce to you. And I'm going to let you take it from here, Kim. All right, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kim Neal. I see I was checking out the chat as Catherine was talking. So some of you are bragging about the weather that you're having in your fabulous locations that you're in. Uh, we're, we're a little cloudy here in Fort Worth, but the, the temperature is good. So I, I envy those of you who have, don't have the clouds that we have. So welcome. Um, on, uh, as you may see, some other faces on your screen, we have Vanessa Campos, uh, Vanessa Wade. <laughs> Vanessa is our office manager. Uh, she makes things happen and our gatekeeper here at the Office of the Police Oversight Monitor. And then we have uh, Kenneth Smith, he likes to be called Kenny, and he is our policy advisor. Hi, Kenny. Um, and they're both here listening on, and they'll, uh, you know, they may uh, interrupt and, and add a few words as well if they feel like I'm not explaining something completely. Um, and so uh, we welcome you here today. Um, I looked at the poll and I see that um, quite a few of you have joined just to build your knowledge about police oversight. Um, as well as that, it's good to see that a number of you are motivated to contribute to positive change uh, regarding police and community relationships. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll learn a lot today and as Catherine said, we have some great resources out there for you to uh, further um, read and, and learn more about uh, this topic. So today, quickly, our agenda, I'll just go briefly over the history of community oversight and law enforcement, um, talk about uh, the three basic models that most uh, cities work from as they develop it or enhance their uh, current models. Um, we'll talk about our office, and uh, our office has been uh, in existence now for a, a little over a year. And so we'll talk about some of our first year key initiatives um, that we think have been successful. And then we'll just have engagement um, between you 
um, in our office just to talk about what your thoughts are, answer any questions you may have, and then we'll conclude, um, hopefully well before uh, the end of the uh, session. So the history of civilian oversight, community oversight of law enforcement. Um, oh, that's right. So before we get started, just to enhance our engagement later on in the presentation, I wanted to talk about just, you know, just, just some engagement um, kind of standards um, so that we can all be respectful of one another. Because sometimes folks feel a certain kind of way about community oversight of law enforcement. And so um, I just want to make sure that we're always, you know, being curious and ready to listen and understand that we're respectful um, and don't judge one another and suspend judgment and just listen with the open ears and open hearts. Um, note any common ground as well as differences that you may have amongst yourselves as we chat. Uh, be authentic. We want you to be true to yourself and welcome that from others. Um, be purposeful and to the point, uh, noting that, you know, we want to make sure that everybody has time to add to the conversation um, and bring um, forth their viewpoints and then just own and guide the conversation so we, we, we can continue to remain on track. Um, so we appreciate that if you can honor that. Now, the history of, of uh, and uh, many times you'll hear it referred to as civilian oversight of law enforcement. And I like to call it community oversight of law enforcement to kind of get from the, our more mili military, um, military um, type of titles. And so, um, so you'll hear me refer to it as community oversight of law enforcement, but it, it is the concept of civilian oversight of law enforcement. And so initially this whole concept, um, it's, you know, we've gotten a lot of uh, uh, press coverage in the last year, um, mostly, you know, due to some of the uh, things that we've seen uh, in footage on the TV regarding encounters with police officers. And so, so for a lot of us, uh, it's a new concept, but I wanted everybody to know that it's actually a concept that started in the early 1900s. Um, and it was at a time when um, policing was considered to be uh, corrupt. Um, a lot of folks believe that policing was controlled a lot by mobsters. And so it was a way for the president to uh, get uh, community members involved to uh, provide oversight of police to kind of clean up policing in communities. And so um, we've since seen um, much from that concept, but that is really where it initially got started. Our next slide shows kind of a timeline of just the, uh, uh, the history of community oversight. So initially back in the early 1900s, the president as a result of the corruption in policing um, formed the uh, National Commission of Law Observance and Enforcement. And that was a way to have community members get involved and make recommendations as it related to ending corruption in policing. Um, and then the first uh, that we know of a uh, complaint review board uh, uh, or a form of civil, uh, community oversight of law enforcement was created in my hometown, which is Washington, D.C. Um, and that proved to not be as viable because uh, it, at its, it was at a time where it was a new concept. It didn't really have any teeth, but it was their first attempt after the President's Commission at the time. And then the Kerner Commission, many of you may have heard that, of that report, then recommended made a formal recommendation during the civil rights era of external oversight of policing. Um, and it was due to all the civil rights activities that were going on at the time and some of the encounters that community members were having, uh, our protesters were having with the police. Uh, Kansas City was the uh, next known uh, community oversight form that uh, uh, really wanted to attack police complaints and also was dealing with the after effects of the civil rights era as well. And then Berkeley, California, which, which has a, uh, and all of these today have phenomenal uh, community oversights, but it's taken some time to really develop their concepts. Uh, but Berkeley, California was the next known community oversight agency that we know of um, that created an independent office outside of the police department. Now, of course, many police departments had complaint departments, um, but the idea of community oversight is that it's independent. Of so some of these cities then created their own separate uh, complaint offices that were completely outside of the police department so that we wouldn't have police officers in effect investigating police officers. And so 
the, the, the rest of the timeline just shows um, the evolution of that process. And it should be noted that in 2016, it was noted that there was 144 of our agencies created across the country. NACOL, which is our National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, um, said that as early as 2020, they had about 200 oversight agencies that were members. But within the last year, they've had at least an additional 130 that have contacted NACOL because they want to form some form of civilian oversight in our community. Now this infographic just kind of shows the concept of community oversight of policing and what its purpose really is um, to uh, all of our stakeholders. And the key is that we wanna ensure that civil rights are protected. We wanna support effective policing. And it's not about being anti-police. It's about ensuring that our policing is equitable and it's effective and it's fair to all. Um, we want to ensure greater accountability of our police officers and our police departments and, and frankly, uh, of our government. Um, it helps manage risk, so it keeps our, hopefully, our lawsuits down uh, against the police department in the cities or counties or localities that they represent. Um, but meanwhile, increases confidence and builds the bridges uh, between um, policing uh, or police officers in our community and enhance those relationships. So those are the key primary factors for why a community oversight agency is so important to cities. Now, there, as I mentioned early on, there's three basic types. And you'll see, if you ever look into this or you have looked into it, um, there, there are no civilian oversight agency or no community oversight agency is ever identical. We have to make sure that when it, wherever you do it, it has to fit your particular look particular uh, environment. Um, and so that's what we've done here in Fort Worth. And so you wanna always make sure um, that, um, that the models, whether it's investigation focus, review focus, or auditor monitor focus, and those are the three primary models, that we tweak those to really be uh, satisfy the needs of your community and your police department. So I'm gonna do just a quick overview of what those three models look like. So first I'm gonna start with the investigation model and I've worked in all three of these models. So investigation model is where we're gonna have a community oversight agency that does its own independent investigations of police officers. So they're gonna work in line with internal affairs. So while internal affairs or what we call internal affairs of police departments are evaluating or in, in investigating their police officers, you're gonna have a separate agency outside of the police department actually doing independent separate investigations. Um, it could replace or duplicate uh, internal police departments, internal affairs within police departments, but for the most part across the country, it's pretty much um, um, duplicated. It's not replaced it. Um, and it's generally staffed by non-police uh, civilian investigators. Now, it doesn't mean that a police officer can't work as an investigator there, but, it, but that person normally cannot be an investigator both in the police department um, and in the uh, civilian oversight agency. Now, we do have a few in the country that have police officers actually working, but again, you know, that goes to customizing it for that community. Now, the strengths of the investigation focus model is that the uh, it may reduce bias in investigations into citizen complaints because you're doing something that is separate and apart from the police department. You also gonna make sure that your investigators because they are non-sworn officers have specialized training and continue to receive specialized training so that you know, we can ensure that they have the, uh, the, the tools that they need to do an effective investigation and it could increase a community trust in the investigations process because so many times when um, communities ask for community oversight of law enforcement, it's because they've lost trust in the complaint investigation process within the police department. Now the weaknesses are, of course, it can be expensive because you're gonna have to hire a whole new set of investigators and run a whole separate sort of really internal affairs outside of the police department. Um, of course, you're gonna face strong resistance from the police um, when you're trying to create a separate agency that's going to hold them accountable. And there may be some issues within the public that feels that 
um, doing this is um, basically uh, setting up an expectation that police conduct is going to automatically change because it's, it's a holistic approach. This is one facet of it, but this is not going to going to be the 100 percent answer to enhancing community and police relationships. The review focus is kind of two, twofold. So you can put a board in place of community members that are appointed by the, by the city or, or county or um, municipality. Um, and that uh, board will then review work of the internal affairs investigations. Um, the board could also review the work of the independent community oversight agency. And that board also can serve as an appellate board. So after an investigation is done, a, a finding is uh, concluded, then that board can act as almost like an appellate board where if the uh, community member doesn't agree with the actual uh, finding, they take it to the board as a, as a, a means of, of appealing the decision. Um, the board would make recommendations to police executives regarding its findings. So um, in addition to its finding of whether the officer uh, violated policy or not, they may make a recommendation that says that you know, all officers have to wear body worn cameras, for example. Um, and then it's often headed by uh, a review board composed of community volunteers. Usually these, uh, these members are not paid volunteers. They may receive stipends in some situations, but most of the time they are unpaid. And their meetings are public. So we wanna make sure that this particular model and all the models that frankly are accountable and transparent, like we want the police department to be accountable and transparent. The strengths and, and weaknesses of the review focus model. Strengths first is that it ensures again that the community has the ability to provide input in the complaint investigation process. Um, it could again, just like the other models, increase the public trust in the process. And it is in fact the least expensive because we have a board in place. They're, for the most part, they're not being paid, but they're acting as community members that are invested in this process of ensuring that our police department is accountable. Uh, the weaknesses, of course, are because of that, they're the least expensive, then their authority is limited. Um, sometimes they have less expertise in policing matters. And so um, it's kind of a learning on your job type of thing, um, learning as you go. And then it may be less independent than other forms of oversight because they're appointed generally by elected or appointed officials. The final uh, uh, model is what uh, the city of Fort Worth has adopted, and that is the auditor monitor focus. And this is a newer model, and this is one that we see a lot of cities nowadays adopting. Um, it often focuses on examining broad patterns. So the monitor focus model is not gonna necessarily do investigations. It could do investigations, but that's not its primary role. Its primary role is really to monitor the, the police department's investigations note any issues or concerns, ensure the investigations are diligent and fair, and then determine if there are any patterns that should be uh, basically pointed out to ensure that we address um, those issues within the police department, and ensure policing is equitable. Um, we look at the quality of investigations, we look at the findings, and we also look at the discipline. We wanna make sure that that's all gonna be um, fair to the police officer, but also fair to the community member as well. Um, we often participate in or monitor internal investigations, and we often seek to, um, to impact change across the police department in a more broad sense. Um, and so it's all, sort of like the broken windows theory where we're trying to address things um, proactively before things actually get worse. Now, some of the weaknesses and strengths of the auditor focus model is that, uh, as far as strengths are concerned, is that often it's the most robust from a public reporting standpoint. Um, it's generally less expensive because we don't have to hire the investigators, um, but we are well versed in investigations. If, for example, we have a whole pro high profile police shooting, we could do the investigation. And it also is very effective at creating long-term systemic changes within police departments. The weaknesses are that we focus on broad pat patterns rather than individual cases. So we're monitoring uh, complaints and cases uh, against police officers, but we're not actually getting into the bread and butter of it. 
but we are monitoring them and making sure that they're fair. Um, sometimes um, their significant expertise is required to conduct systematic policy evaluation. So in our office, what we do is we confer with experts in the field and we do benchmarking studies to ensure that we have that expertise. And many times monitors, we, make on, we only make recommendations. We cannot compel law enforcement agencies. And so that's where you have a reporting piece come in. Who, who does the monitor report to? Who does the police chief report to? Who has the ability to ensure that the changes are being made? And so these are just some of the cities that have adopted the various models uh, throughout the country. Again, we have more than 200, but these are just some of the cities. Next slide. All right, so I have an engagement question for everyone. Um, and so I think, is that the best way to do that, Catherine? Would that be in the chat room? Or can we just talk out loud? Yeah. Okay. Um, they can't talk out loud unless they bring them in. So the chat is the better way to respond. And then if they want to ask questions, they can put it in the questions tab. Okay, sounds good. So my engagement question to you is, what are your thoughts after hearing about community oversight, law enforcement, and the, uh, all the models? Um, is there one that you like more than another for your community? And I know many of you are from here in Fort Worth or any comments that you have about our office here in Fort Worth or what you would like us to, to, to do differently. Um, I welcome your feedback. And if you just put um, your comments uh, in the in the chat box. But again, if you have questions, as Catherine stated, feel free to put that under the questions uh, tab. So Kim, one of the questions that we have is from Brian and, and he's asking, do members of the oversight committee go on ride alongs with the officers and can they in, uh, attend force on force training? Yes, all that can happen. And have we done it in Fort Worth yet? Yet, No, because uh, when we started uh, in March, uh, I started in March, March 2nd or 3rd, three weeks in we had COVID. So we haven't done any of that, but the intent and where I came from, which was a previous city where I was uh, director for and the investigations model, the review model, um, all of the employees as well as all of the board members had to go through a full training at the police department and from um, our civil rights uh, folks about uh, civil uh, folks' civil rights, the laws that apply, stops. We talked about force. And also there was a requirement that, and there is a requirement, going to be a requirement here in Fort Worth that everybody also goes through the uh, ride-alongs as well. And our staff is gonna be soon going to all the uh, police department's roll calls here in Fort Worth as well. And Monique said frequent updates of projects or tasks to the community if, the, if not already done. Okay, so from our perspective here in Fort Worth, what we do is we try to update our website as often as we can, but we just recently sent out a newsletter. So right now the newsletter is coming out uh, quarterly. Um, However, if we have some special news, we've created a listserv and then we also utilize the city's uh, communications and um, department to get the word out to our residents through Gov delivery. So we have different mechanisms that we use, um, but we try to do it as frequently as, as we're able to. Okay. I think that's all the questions at this point. Okay, all right, well. We'll keep it moving. All right, so now I'll talk specifically about our office, the Office of the Police Oversight Monitor. Um, not a fancy name. Um, you'll see some, some organizations like ours throughout the country come up some, with some really, really snazzy names like Office of Police Accountability, Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Um, but we're all, we all serve the same purpose. Um, our office was established by city ordinance in February of 2020, last year. Um, and then we actually officially opened our doors in mid-March of 2020, as I stated, right in the midst of COVID. And so our vision is to be a proactive leader in law enforcement accountability um, of Fort Worth law enforcement and the population that serves, sorry for the typo. And then our mission is to serve as a designated community oversight agency empowered to act in fairly and impartially, ensuring greater accountability of and public trust in Fort Worth law enforcement. 
Um, again, you know, keep in mind that community oversight law enforcement, I think so many times folks think that it is against law enforcement and we're not. We are really advocates for the community, but we're also advocates for police. We take complaints, but we also take accommodations. We are the folks who kind of are the impartial body that kind of sits right in the middle and wants to make sure that the entire process is equitable and fair for everyone involved. And so some of our primary functions include, um, of course, oversight and accountability, but we also intake complaints and monitor inquiries. So many times we get calls from citizens and it may not amount to the level of a complaint, but it's an inquiry from a citizen. They're trying to get more information. They don't understand why the officer did what uh, he or she did. Um, and so we're able to answer those questions because we have the knowledge base in our office to be able to know what the answers are, but we can also look up matters and figure it out. And if they're trying to get in touch with someone in the police department to get further information, we can make that happen. So it may not necessarily be a complaint, but they just can't get a call back from the police department. So if we can be the, their eyes for them or their voice for them as well. Um, we also look at law enforcement policies and procedures and we do reviews, we do analysis and we do recommendations. So some of the recommendations that we've issued uh, are on use of force. Um, the city has a use of force review board like a lot of cities do. Uh, we made recommendations on that. We've made recommendations on recruit pra uh, practices. We made recommendations on training. Um, we made recommendations around the body worn camera program. And so far to date, all of those recommendations have been accepted. And so we've been pretty busy in our year, but we've been doing some really effective um, collaboration with both community and police to make these things happen. We also audit law enforcement practices. So uh, body worn cameras, for example, that's a big program that's constantly being audited um, by both the officers or, or supervisors within the police department or at our various divisions, but as well as by our office. We're looking for patterns that we can identify. Community engagement, like we're having here today, we've done probably over 200 community engagements throughout the city of Fort Worth. Um, and, and all of those were virtual um, because of COVID. And so we've met a, quite a few people and gotten a lot of information out. And also, we've also learned a lot about our communities in Fort Worth to ensure that we're doing the best job that we can. Um, a big piece of what we do is research and data collection and analysis. So we always want to look for, look at data, because data shows us uh, where we need to improve. And so uh, we're getting together now um, data together for our annual report that we plan to put out that just talks about um, the, the types of complaints we receive, what the allegations have been, the demographics of the complainants, the demographics of the officers, and is really to look and see if there's any patterns or trends that we need to be identifying um, so that we can address them proactively. And then um, my hope is to create a mediation program um, that will, uh, in essence, be uh, a not a, a voluntary, pro it's a voluntary program, a confidential program, but it is in lieu of the complaint process, hopefully, where we can get community members and, and the officers that they encounter in a room to talk about an encounter to hopefully erase some mutual awareness, but also raise some cultural sensitivity of both uh, individuals. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say with the community engagement piece, um, the other big uh, piece of that that I'm, I'm an advocate of and I've done um, in previous um, uh, jobs is the Know Your Rights campaign. So I wanna, we are, we're going to be developing a Know Your Rights campaign for community members um, where when they have encounters with police officers, what, what, what should they do? Um, and then talk about some of the key laws around stops, whether they're auto, bicycle, pedestrian, and then actually bring police officers in the room and work out scenarios and talk about a bad scenario versus a good scenario. And this is a great way to get kids involved early on um, and ensure that they understand what the laws are as it relates to things that I've mentioned. So all of these are functions of our office that we do each and every day. Kim, there's a couple of questions. Um, sure. The first question is from Steve. 
given your experience so far in Fort Worth, what one or two improvements would you think would be the most beneficial? Um, I think one would be the mediation program. Um, we have we have uh, community several communities in Fort Worth, and so depending on which community you're going to, you're going to get a different perspective of policing. And so it's it's I think it's in our best interest to. Uh, particularly in our more marginalized communities, to do a mediation program where we can talk out these issues, but it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily show as a red flag on the officer's file. It really is a way for the officer to hear how the community member felt, and then it's a good way for the community member to feel what the officer's thoughts were when they had the encounter, and that way we can raise an awareness and an understanding between the two parties. I mean, I think we can really impact relationships in some of those communities if we do something like that. Um, the other piece of it would be to, uh, I think, really just do more encounters with police and community. Um, I'm sorry, not encounters, engagements. Last year, we did a police community engagement virtually um, where we had breakout sessions. And I heard overwhelmingly from community that they want more of those. They want to be in a room with officers not necessarily uh, coming there for a specific program, but also to give them a problem and to be able to solve it together in a breakout session um, that is, is a problem in their community and actually have officers and community work out what the possible solutions, recommendations of solutions could be, and then to actually get them involved. And I think in, in the long run, that really helps the police department because now you're building up trust in that community, but also it helps the community because they also know that they're being a part of the solution. And so those are two things that hopefully we can get going um, with Texas opening up and, and you know us being able to get out in the community more. Okay. And the next question is from Ms. Geraldine, and she wants to know if there are any regular citizens on the board. Okay, so right now in Fort Worth, we don't have a board as of yet. So the first rec so what we did was um, the city, prior to me getting here, we had a race and culture task force. Um, and it was appointed um, uh, by city leaders. Um, and that race and culture task force came up with the recommendation either do a board or we do a form of civilian oversight for the city of Fort Worth. And the administration chose to create this office um, which was the Office of the Police Oversight Monitor. And so the idea was that this office would do a lot of things of what the board would do. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be the final solution. What we're working on right now is creating a board or, or making a recommendation to council, I should say. I have key members of the community working together and meeting periodically who are coming up with a recommendation for a, a policy review board um, that would review policies and procedures of the police department and make recommendations to the police department. And that ad hoc group, because it's a, just a temporary group we put together of community members, it has community members, it has city leaders, and it has police on it. So we're all in agreement when we reach the consensus of what that board should look like. And so, um, and so that board, if, and so what we'll do with that is the, that once that recommendation is finalized, I'll take that to council on behalf of this ad hoc group. And then it's up to the council to determine if they wanna move forward with it. Um, hopefully they will. Um, I made the suggestion to the council back in December and that's why we moved forward with talking to this ad hoc group, creating and talking to this ad hoc group, and then we can make some progress there. So right now we don't have a board um, but we hope to hopefully we'll have one uh, in the near future. Okay, and the final question so far is from Monique. And will there be a program that targets working with youth that interact with the police? Yes. So when I talked about the the Know Your Rights campaign, that's one of that's one of the components of the program, and that's what I've done in the past. Is that we want to specifically tailor that program not just for community of, uh, folks or adults. We also want to our children in the school system. So I've had at least one school reach out to me. Um, it's a specialized school, but one school reached out to me to actually do something like this and bring the officers in the room. Now I can tell you that there are some situations where folks just don't want officers in the room. 
when we talk about these issues. And I try to encourage that we bring officers um, if it makes them feel more comfortable, if the office is out of uniform, then we can probably work that out. But it, it works better if the officers are in the room, but we will definitely be focusing on young people and, and specifically our junior high and high school students. We definitely wanna make an impact there. So um, that's definitely something we have going forward. Hopefully we'll be doing our first program this summer. All okay. right, so the um, organizational structure, we're a small office uh, right now. And, um, and so David Cook is our city manager and I report directly to him. And, and when I talked early on about the structures of some of, uh, some of our civilian oversight offices, and I talked about it's all about who reports to who. So just to give you an example, I report to the city manager, um, but the police chief reports to a deputy city manager. And that was something specifically that the Fort Worth community asked for. They did not want me reporting to the same person that the police chief reported to. They wanted me reporting to someone that was higher up than who the police chief reported to, to show some form of accountability. And then, as I mentioned, we have Vanessa Campo. She's our office manager. We have uh, two interns. One right now is on break. Uh, Tiffany Daniels, she's from our local law school. Um, but then we also have Owen Crum, who's been an intern in our office for a while. And they've both, both been very helpful in doing research on policies and procedures um, and, and uh, other components of the program. Tiffany's been very helpful with trying to create the mediation program that I talked about. And we're starting up an internship program um, this summer where we're going to bring in a bunch of law school interns to work on some other uh, matters like the Know Your Rights campaign, help us develop that campaign and so forth. And then in the fall, we are partnering with the law school to create a community oversight uh, a law enforcement clinic program um, where uh, students will take a class, but then also work in our office for credit to learn more about community oversight and do some research and benchmarking in that area. So it's really gonna be state of the art. It's something that's unheard of in the country. And so I'm really excited about that. Um, we have a deputy director position that's vacant right now. We're in the process of hiring for, and then of course I introduce you to Pitt, uh, Kenny, and we also have Nathan Benson who's out of the office today. Uh, he is also a policy advisor in our office. The next two slides are just, um, I won't go over them specifically, but they are just a timeline that just shows you how much work we've done in just a year. Um, that I, I'm really proud of. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention under March 2020, you'll see uh, acquired CJIS certification, which is a criminal justice information systems, um, uh, which is, comes under the Justice Department. And so uh, I encourage um, my peers in the industry, I talk to them all the time and, and try to give them some, uh, some assistance in, in how to create their offices and enhance their offices by encourage folks across the country all the time to get their CJIS certification. And CJIS allows folks that are non-sworn officers to be able to access the records of law enforcement. Um, and you have to uh, attest to confidentiality and there's certain procedures you have to follow to ensure the confidentiality of law enforcement records. And so everyone in my office, uh, with the exception of the interns, because they don't deal with police files, um, are all CJIS certified. And so we are able to access uh, uh, police systems and do our research that we need uh, to be done. And I can tell you that having that ability and not all my peers have that ability across the country, sometimes they have to make the request of the police department, but for us to have unfettered access to the police department really uh, goes to the testament of our police chief and our prior police chief who really want to ensure that they're that our police department is transparent and accountable. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. But the rest of the slide just talks about different things that we've done since day one. We, we did a survey that was absolutely, a, I thought was a good survey, um, particularly in light of all the, all the pressure that we were going through with COVID um, and in the documents that I provided you today that you can uh, look at, at, at sometime in the future I did provide you with our survey analysis report that was done by an independent PhD student um, that just shows we did a survey of community and of um, police officers 
And we'll talk about that in a minute briefly, but that survey report just gave, gave me kind of the, uh, a, a lens, an open lens picture of what, you know, residents and police officers thought about community and police relationships in Fort Worth. And so that report is about 50 pages. Um, I gave you uh, as a sample of one of the uh, documents you can look at. And then the next slide just talks about some of the other things that we're doing. Um, we serve on the, um, the oral board. The oral board is something like an interview panel for new recruits for the police department. We monitor that. We also monitor the use of force review board, which is the board that is, uh, is a police department board, but it reviews every use of force that has been done by a police officer. And so we monitor that. Um, um, a lot of my peers don't have the, uh, have the fortune to be able to do that. And so that's a good thing. Um, and then we just continue to always make sure we're, we stay in tune and are current on promising police practices. So that's a big thing. We have a um, virtual uh, employee collaboration session starting up next week, and we'll have community collaborations starting up this summer. So we just continue to move and groove um, as we uh, develop our office. This right here, if someone files a complaint with our office, um, and Vanessa uh, put this together, uh, this is a great piece of work here where it shows our flow chart for um, receiving complaints in our office and how we receive them, but then the process that it goes through. Um, it's a pretty tight process. Um, and we, what we tell, uh, one of the things that when I came on board, one of the things I heard from community members overwhelmingly was that when they filed a complaint with the police department, a lot of times they didn't know the status of their complaint. And that's what a lot of cities hear. And so, um, so we want to, we, so we talked to the police department they have made their complaint process more accountable. They're communicating with citizens more through the use of letters and calls and so forth and making sure they're aware of what's going on. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that if, if we're going to serve as an avenue for complaint taking, that we also have a process that is transparent and accountable. And so we have timelines in there to make sure that citizens know when they're going to hear from our office. Um, and, you know, if there are extenuating circumstances where we can't do it within 90 days, we let the citizen know that. Um, but we're always in constant communication with community members about their complaints. So some of the initiatives, uh, next slide in our first year was, of course, the establishment of our office. Um, we created various communication mediums so we can make sure we can get the word out about our office. Um, we created the complaint and accommodation intake and review process. And I can tell you right now, if we, you go to our website, you'll see a form where citizens can fill out for complaints. But what we're working on right now that we hope to go uh, live fairly soon is a more interactive form where when, once a community member fills out the complaint form, that they're able to then, that information will go into a database and we're able to do queries of information to look at what type, you know, what types of allegations are we getting? Um, is there one allegation that we're seeing more of than another against officers, the demographics of the officers, the demographics of the community members, so that we can start studying these issues. And so the, the form will work in hand with the database to be able to track some of that information. Um, as I stated, we continue to research promising police practices and making recommendations. And some of these are the recommendations that we made um, in uh, the slide, uh, on this slide. And then we continue to monitor complaints and inquiries um, of the, uh, the, the PD investigation system. Um, as I said earlier, we monitor use, all uses of force, including critical incidents like officer involved shootings. Um, since I've been here a little over a year, we've had one uh, officer involved shooting. Um, and so, um, um, so we monitor that one, uh, and we are monitor, monitoring that one very closely. Um, deaths in custody and then uses of force resulting in severe bodily injury or death. Um, we've had multiple community, community stakeholder meetings. Um, we con continue to meet with the police department um, regularly. The chief of police has a staff meeting, a plan staff meeting every Monday that I attend. He and I meet every uh, biweekly. 
um, to keep each other. Um, we also do uh, a lot of media interviews, uh, media presentations, um, as well as I talk to you about the community and officer perception survey and publication of that report. And then we're looking to produce our first annual report, hopefully this summer. Uh, we serve as the monitor on the oral recruitment board, which again is the interview board for new recruits. Um, we serve as a monitor on the use of force review board, which again is the uh, every use of force that an officer has committed. Um, we attend and observe um, Fort Worth law enforcement training um, and um, both um, Kenny and Nathan have received some cert additional certifications as a result of that. Um, we continue to research and draft our complaint mediation process and partner with police on some key community and problem oriented policing initiatives. Um, and then, you know, like I said, most proud of the partnership that we've reached with Texas A&M Law School inter externship program because that has really proved phenomenal for our office, particularly because our office is so small. And I often recommend to my peers in this field when they have a small office and they feel like they need more staffing, then intern, interns, experienced interns are really the way to go to do some of the things that maybe are, we can leave some of the other things like the sieges related uh, stuff to our staff and have the interns do the research. And so the law school externship program is proven to be great because they can do the legal research and, and do the benchmarking for us that we need. Kim, you have, there's a question from Dennis. He wants to know what type of training you have as far as use of force. Is that for um, staff or is that just in general police department or? He doesn't. Maybe okay. talk about both. So the, um, the training that's done is um, training that's done at the uh, police department. So we have a, a, a fairly good relationship Police department has what they call a use of force coordinator. Um, and he is a lieutenant that works for a deputy chief. And he is the one that generally gives most of the training or he uh, uh, has other folks that uh, work with him to give training in the academy. And so um, that training is something that staff has attended and attends um, regularly. We, we attend it in the, in mostly in the auditing sense um, to just kind of look and see what the officers are learning. Um, and so the other piece of that would be uh, if they receive outside training from um, leaders in that field, then our staff has also gone to that training as well. And generally that's in the police, within the police department, it's at the academy. So hopefully I'll answer your question, Dennis. All right, and then, um, continuation on with our first year initiatives. Um, as I stated earlier, we created this working group who's working on a recommendation to council that hopefully uh, we'll, hopefully we can get that recommendation to council sometime in June or early July. Uh, we've been meeting since December 31st um, for every two weeks and we um, continue to um, meet. Uh, we took a little break uh, from March to April, but we're starting to meet up again um, to talk about that recommendation. Um, we're creating that tracking and reporting system for complaints, findings, and recommendations. So that's the database that we're working with our IT department to create on our behalf. And we meet with, Vanessa and I meet with them uh, every two weeks or so uh, to ensure that um, they're coming along and they're doing a great job. Um, we continue to conduct policing trend review and identify policing patterns. Um, which is big because we, again, we always want to be proactive um, in identifying uh, uh, patterns, but also uh, recommending uh, policing trends. We always want to be proactive. We don't want to ever be reactive. Um, and then we are coordinating with the IT department on our database. Now the surveys, um, as I mentioned, and I just want to give some bragging rights here, so we did the officer perception survey, we did the community perception survey, and we had it open for two weeks. Um, we got over 51% of the sworn officers to respond. And I can tell you that the, even the police chief was surprised at that number. 
Um, and then we got we got about approximately 0.5% of the total population, which was about 4,000. And I understand that um, that's a pretty good number, even though I thought it was pretty low, it was a pretty good number. And what I was more concerned about was the diversity of the population that responded. And we had pretty diverse population from all areas of the city respond to the survey. So it was good to see that. Would I have liked more people to respond? Absolutely. But um, the diversity of the respondents was really uh, key for me as well. From the officer survey, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, next slide. We had 68.5% believe that ongoing de-escalation training is necessary. And that was key for me because it's good to know that officers want to know all the key you know, areas of de-escalation. That's the big topic nowadays with um, so much footage being caught on TV. Um, and so that was really good to hear that more than a majority of the force want the de-escalation training. Uh, many know that the need for increased transparency, they want to participate in the community and outreach and engagement efforts, and, and they want increased understanding in the role and actions of the police. They want the community to understand what their roles are. So when I talk about that mediation program, I think this is the exact uh, venue that we can use to increase that understanding. And um, mostly important, they want to establish partnerships to address problems in the community. Again, that's a problem-oriented policing standpoint. That's a big issue that came up in the, um, President, uh, the uh, President Obama's 21st century uh, policing um, standard. And so uh, we want to just um, honor that. And we're happy to see the officers were for that. Um, note um, need for more support from leadership. So they want more support from city leaders, improve recruiting efforts, and they want uh, improved um, diversity efforts within their specialized units. Um, and so we've worked with, when I talk about us making recommendations to the police department on recruiting efforts, it's around those issues, diversity. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, although most respondents offer constructive responses, what I call constructive criticism, um, some did depict uh, issues with morale and disconnect in the perceptions of community police relationships. Um, so we want to we want to help facilitate that. We want to feed off of that, and we want to turn some of those minds around. So that's our goal here in this office. Um, so we just picked one response that we thought uh, was uh, was a good one when there was a question about suggestions for assuring the public that police are held accountable. Um, an officer said, "This will never be accomplished until a mode of talking is established. Real time information podcasts." long form conversation. Until police and public can dialogue like co-citizens, there will never be true trust on police. Bad ideas and misinformation must be addressed and challenged on both sides. Um, so we thought that that was an excellent perspective from a police officer to share. Now, from our community standpoint, 62% uh, have a positive view of the police department's performance. The majority of all racial groups, because Fort Worth is a very diverse city, um, notes that they were treated fairly by police department. And when I say FWPDS, Fort Worth Police Department, um, except our, our Black Americans, 41.2% did not believe they were treated fairly. So that's where we need to do our work. Um, majority of residents, 52.6%, notes that community oversight of Fort Worth Police Department is very important. And I can tell you that the percentage was not as high for police officers, which uh, it never is um, when you talk about someone else coming in and providing oversight. And while many respondents remain hopeful that, um, that, uh, hopeful that um, relationships between community and police will improve, they had caveats about it. Um, uh, re they recited that the need for additional community and recreational programs. So mental health resources and more funding for schools and after school programs in order to reduce pre and prevent crime. So it, as you can tell, these aren't policing issues, right? So these are concerns about community and how we operate. Um, and so it's a holistic approach that the city needs to take. It's not just about policing. And so that's when, when, when I started this presentation, I talked about how 
media oversight is a solution, but it's not a 100% solution. There are other things that need to happen to make all of this work. And so these are some of the things that we agree that we need to improve on and that we need to encompass in this holistic approach. Um, and so we're going to, so, so from the perspective of my office and community oversight of law enforcement, you know, we're making recommendations about how police off, police department work with mental health resources and the police department has proactively done that. Um, we're talking about recreational programs. Um, when we talk about know your rights, that can easily be a recreational program that we take into the recreation centers. Um, and then after school fund, after uh, school funding for programs as well, where we can also take that Know Your Rights program into. And then so one of the responses that we thought was, was a, a holistic response um, to a question that was about whether uh, a person was hopeful that Fort Worth community police relationships will be better in the future. Um, the quote is, while I remain hopeful that anything is possible, I believe that we must begin to be totally transparent and fair of the policing done in communities of color. This must start by putting those who look like the communities they serve. Relations are not, will not improve until there is a shift in truly engaging in the communities when there is no crime, but learning and understanding the communities and culture. And so when we talk about the perceptions of community oversight, I just wanted to show you in that survey, um, when we say police officers um, and then community members, um, not at all, they didn't think it was important, 54% police officers <laughs> versus a lot thinking community oversight was important, community thought 52%. So it's interesting that those percentages are, are similar, but they're at different ends of the spectrum. I uh, see that we have one question. What level of subpoena powers does your office have into matters low, medium, or high? My office at current, uh, currently doesn't have any subpoena power. And so you, what you'll find across the country, some community oversight agencies do have subpoena power and some um, oversight agencies do not have subpoena power. And those agencies are, there's generally a, the previous agency I came from, I did have subpoena power, but there's usually steps that you have to use to employ that subpoena power. And generally that involves involving your legislative body. Um, so if you have, if you want to use a subpoena, then you have to go to generally your legislative body to ask, to basically state your case, and then that legislative body would agree to it. Now, the key is, do you ever have to use your uh, subpoena power? And I can tell you the agency that I came from where we had subpoena power for over 20 years, we never had to use subpoena power. Um, and that was because anything that we needed, we, we, we received. And if there was any hesitancy, again, I reported to the city manager, the police chief reported to a deputy city manager, the city manager would intervene or the police chief would intervene and make sure that the information we needed was received. So it is about relationship building between the two departments um, and so versus I've spoken to some of my peers who use subpoena power all the time, but they of course have a more contentious relationship with their police chief and sometimes their, their city leaders as well. Uh, so I think it just varies uh, for the community. Um, perceptions about community oversight, um, most importantly, we thought it was interesting that both officers and community members um, thought that advancing fair and professional policing that the response of the community needs was the most important. Um, where they varied was what was least important. Officers did not want uh, community oversight to investigate complaints and provide recommended findings um, versus um, the community thought that the, you know, our office serving as a public speaker and disseminate information. It's not that they, they didn't want it, they just thought that they wanted us to focus on more um, specific tasks as it related to enhancing relationships. Kim, there's a couple of new questions. Um, mm -hmm. Dennis is asking, do, do the police interact with kids at community events? Do they participate in sports, football, basketball with them? Um, absolutely, um, they do. Um, and the chief has just created a pro a unit called the community partnership, the community safety partnership unit. 
And that unit, um, he has selected officers to be in that unit. And that unit is supposed to specifically focus on reaching out to the young population as well as the population as a whole and, uh, and, and ensuring that there's some um, collaboration with those communities. So we're gonna use that unit in the Know Your Rights program to act out some of the scenarios that we talked about. Um, and so, yes, they are absolutely there uh, in events. They're absolutely there uh, 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 in sporting events with young people. Is it consistent throughout the city? No, um, but they're, they're definitely doing that. And I think that also answered Brian's question. He, he was asking if Fort Worth PD has a police activities program. And so I see that Ella is saying she did not receive a survey. So Ella, um, we, we use several medium to uh, get the survey out. So I'm not sure if you're signed up for Gov Delivery. Um, and, and Catherine, I don't know if you want to say something about that, but um, that was one of the medium that we use, which a lot of city residents have signed up to receive information um, regarding that, um, you know, things that are going on in surveys. The city does surveys all the time of its residents. So I'm not sure if that's something you've signed up for. Yeah, Ms. Ellis, so anyone that's on this, uh, th that's in this session right now that is from the city of Fort Worth, one thing you can do is go to the city's website, fortworthtexas.gov. And when you first come on, if you're not a member of the Gov Delivery City News System, then it, you, it, you'll see a pop-up that says, do you want to receive this information and sign up for City News? You just share your email address and then you can choose what types of things that you want to receive notifications about from the city. So that's one way that we will push out information, including surveys. Another way is to be on Nextdoor, Facebook, Twitter, or to work with your neighborhood association and make sure that they are signed up for our Community Engagement Weekly Bulletin. All right. Uh, so next slide. So some of the sample recommendations that came out of the survey analysis um, was that our office should engage the police and community in a more positive and constructive methods in order to improve relationships. So we're all on that and we're all in favor of it and because we definitely want to eliminate assumptions and as well as unfair biases. So hopefully a lot of the information that I shared with you today show that some of the tools that we're using to actually do that. Um, the city should ensure that communities have the tools and information they need to address community issues and concerns. So, for example, when we did our community collaboration sessions last summer, one of the things that uh, came out of that consistently was that some of our community members, our neighborhood association said that, you know, if we just had, uh, 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 if police officers were able to give an information sheet to our citizens, um, that gave key numbers. Let's say they're responding to a situation that involves someone with a uh, mental health concern. Um, and so if that person needed further help, what, what are the resources that the police officers could recommend um, you know, that person contact? And so um, talking about that, that new unit that was put together, I've already uh, conversed with them they're, they're on it, they're creating, um, we're working with their office to create that, that resource document and ensuring that the officers have that in their car. Um, they're working on it right now so that they can pass that information out. And then within our office, um, Vanessa is, 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 has been uh, creating a bunch of resources so that when folks call our office, we're able to um, actually give that information out numbers, tools, and so forth, websites for those who need additional help that's outside of the parameters of what we do. Um, and then finally, um, they felt that the police department uh, should include diverse community members' input in its problem-solving projects, community policing efforts, and its development and changes to policies and procedures. And, and so that's where I feel that my office comes in because when I talk about the different boards we serve on, you know, I'm also having a conversation with the police department about how can we get community members on these boards, um, these police department boards. So we serve as a voice for our community. And that leads me to the, to the quote here. Real engagement is more than just conversation. It means giving the public a voice in how their communities are policed. And that's exactly what our agency 
is here to serve, to make sure that communities have a voice in that process. So our final slide is just some engagement questions or any questions that you may have uh, or comments you may have, um, but the engagement questions are what are ways to enhance community and police relationships that you know that you feel are ways to enhance community and police relationships. How do you feel? How do you feel when you view footage documented a community member police encounter? I mean, it seems like sometimes that every week you turn on the TV, there's some type of footage on that, whether it's positive or negative. Um, how can you contribute to the enhancement of community and police relationships in your various communities? And what are your hopes for community police relationships? So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, you know, anything anybody wants to add or any comments or any responses to those questions, um, we welcome. And um, uh, Kenny and Vanessa, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add as well. Okay, so we have one person, no preference at this time. Let's see. And Doc Kent from our office has shared some information so that you can sign up for City News and then and Vanessa Comp has put the website on there as well. Uh, yeah, I see Doc Kent says, I think the hybrid model you described seems best. Um, it does. And again, you know, it's just a matter of that community and what you feel is best. I think no model is going to be the answer to any one community. I think you really definitely have to tweak it for the community that you that you live in, work in, reside in, um, and are looking to have community oversight in. Wow, Kim, it looks like people like you. You're reading oh. the comments on the bottom. <laughs> it's always good to hear that. <laughs> try to be likable. <laughs> You know, we have to collaborate all the time. So we, you know, that's the only way we're going to get things done if we collaborate and try to um, understand what everybody's viewpoint is. Um, so again, the documents the, in the file section, we have a copy of this presentation. Um, and I noticed, in, in, I guess when we converted it, some of it uh, didn't convert properly. So forgive us for that. There was some words I saw kind of hanging off to the side, but I, I think it must have been a conversion issue. Some of our uh, media uh, information that, and I call it media, but it's not for the media, it's for the community, but we, it's in our media kit, we call it. Um, we have a pamphlet that we've created for our office that we have there. We also have the survey report, the final survey report that I talked about. Um, the latest newsletter that came out um, this month, um, or in the last month, I can't remember. Uh, the spring newsletter is there for you. Uh, our informational sheet, which is just a two pager that we use to just kind of let people know about our office. Um, one of the things that you know that I'm most proud of is our business card. It's not anybody's specific business card, but it's a little card. It's just a business card that says if you have a concern or a uh, accolade of the police department or a police officer, uh, call us. Um, and it gives our website, our email, and it's just a business card um, and you can fit it in your wallet and you'd be surprised at the number of people that will take that card, you know, and walk right into our office and show that card that I did it be previously and it used to happen all the time. So the card works um, and it's good to have that. And then of course, um, I, I have here just kind of a document um, that is on the NACOL website, which again is the National Association of S Civilian Oversight and Law Enforcement, um, that is called Paves the Road to Police Accountability. But it just talks about all those models that I discuss. Again, their strengths and weaknesses. It talks about examples in the various cities and what they did. Um, and so it's just kind of further elaborates um, on what we talked about here today. So hopefully all of that is helpful to you. And again, if there's any information, I think the last slide, um, Catherine, um, provides our contact information. Um, there is one other question that we have. Uh, one of our residents, Steve, asks if your office works with Ms. Brooks. Um, they watched one of her sessions yesterday. Yes, yes. We uh, Well, you know, and I work with all the directors, but uh, absolutely. Uh, Christina and I actually started just a month or two apart. 
Um, and so we have, we're both dedicated to uh, improving um, police and community relationships. And often um, she gets a call, and I, particularly if it's a call about somebody's concern about their civil rights being violated or a discrimination claim, generally both our office get, gets the call. So we, we work together hand in hand to try to figure out who's going to take on the issue uh, initially and then kind of try to keep both, uh, both parties aware as we move on in the review. So yeah, absolutely. Um, lots of, of comments about individual cities and what they are doing and what, what some of them are not. Um, but no additional questions. Um, looks like we have just a couple of minutes. So I, I do want to thank everyone, especially Kim and her team, for being here this afternoon. This has been an extremely productive and well-attended class. Um, lots of great questions uh, and comments. And just as a reminder, this is being recorded and it will be available after Monday on this same site. And you'll be able to access all of the files that Kim has also so graciously shared with us. So thank you to everyone for being here. All of her contact information is on the slide up front. Um, and if there's anything else that Kim, any other parting words? Yes. Um, I did want to recognize uh, Frank Scott's comment. Um, where he talks about being out with his grandson and just stopping a cop. That's exactly, you know, the thing that I'm talking about. When I when I ask, you know, what can you do to enhance community police relationships? It's not about implementing a program. It's not about, you know, getting a whole group together and talking out the issues. It's just about, you know, talking to your grandson or talking to your daughter or talking to your friend or talking to your neighbor about, you know, police and community relationships, having that conversation. And knowing who the cops are that uh, that are you know patrolling your neighborhood and creating that relationship, so it's something as simple as that that starts the dialogue. So thank you, uh, Mr. Scott, for for adding that, and I and I hope that is uh, that proves to be a, a pretty good relationship that you start for your for your grandson. Absolutely. Okay, y'all have an amazing afternoon, and we will see you. Hopefully, you guys are going to be going to. The 1230 session where we're going to be showcasing the awards finalist presentations and then at two we have our awards ceremony so we hope to see you at both of those events and then our next workshop i believe starts at 3 30. so y'all have a great afternoon thank you